Good evening. My name is Luke Powery, the Dean of Duke University Chapel. Um, you might be interested in knowing that what you were hearing um, through the organ as an attempt to set the mood for this evening was three psalm preludes by Herbert, Ho Herbert Howells. Psalm 34, which says, Lo, the poor crieth, and the Lord heareth. Psalm 37, but the meek spirited shall possess the earth. And Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And so welcome to this sacred space, what James B. Duke, one of the chief benefactors of the university, called the Great Towering Church, and you can see why he would say that. And what James B. Duke envisioned to be the center of campus here, uh, the heart of the university, this sacred space that will hold the joys and sorrows of a community, we also hope that people would come to recognize this great towering church as a great loving church as well. And particularly this conversation that we're holding tonight is really about caring for the living and the dying. Um, this conversation about death and dying is actually built into the very architecture of this building. To my right, we have the Memorial Chapel, where three dukes are laid to rest. And then down in the lower level, we have the crypt. And so it's hard to enter this space and not encounter death or this conversation about death and dying. And this isn't to say anything about the sermons that you might hear from the pulpit, that they bore people to death, hopefully not. But this evening conversation around the topic dignity, diversity, and visions of a good death is an important one. It's in line with our bridge panel series that we host here at the chapel around various topics where we seek to connect people from different um, parts of life, aspects of life, walks of life in order to discover shared pathways toward the beloved community of God. And particularly for this conversation, I want to give lots of credit to Dr. David Cassaret and his colleagues at Duke Palliative Care, and also Dean Marion Broom, the Dean of the School of Nursing, uh, for having the vision to hold this uh, conversation in the chapel uh, with these particular panelists. Actually, this conversation is a collaboration between all three units, Duke Chapel, School of Nursing, and the Duke Center for Palliative Care. And in so doing, I think it signifies something important, that there's an acknowledgement that the end of life matters, and it matters, and end of life matters, are not only about medicine and biology, but they are also about issues such as purpose and faith. And so some of the questions that our panelists will be tackling this evening are, what would you do if you knew you had a year to live, a month or a day? How would you spend your time? Who would you spend time with and what would you do? To me, these questions are very timely. You may know that this week, in particular, the legendary evangelist Billy Graham died at the age of, nine, of 99. You may or may not know that Reverend Graham actually preached from that particular pulpit here in Duke Chapel three different times. And in one of his sermons 45 years ago from that pulpit, he said, every generation passes away, you will die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. Now, how are you going to face that great crisis of death? It's a pretty stark question for us. But he also said, if you are prepared to die, I believe you are prepared to live. So my hope this evening is as we focus on this topic of death, 
we are not only trying to see what a good death might mean, but also being empowered to lead good lives. And without that, um, and with that, um, let me introduce Dean Marion Broom, the Dean of School of Nursing. Let's welcome Marion. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the school and actually on behalf of all nurses here at Duke, um, I welcome each of you. And as I thought about what would I say, um, I'd just like to share a little story from a lifelong commitment to this topic. My area of research was always in pediatric pain. And early in my, can't hear, what happened? <laughs> Just go closer, yeah. Um, early in my practice, I actually was uh, one of the um, few um, health professionals that was um, able to work with, they had the honor to work with parents who were losing their children. There is no, um, no greater space in terms of get, helping you get your very young head <laughs> and young self in um, and, and frankly, in connection with uh, your higher power and, and theirs. And what I learned working, so many people would say to me, aren't you afraid to work with? What are, what are you going to say to the parents? What are they going to say to you? And a good colleague of mine, a pediatrician, said, as long as you stay in fear or let other people encourage you to stay in fear with those parents, you'll never be in relationship with them. And if you're not in relationship, you can't be present for them and they need every ounce of your presence. And that, has, that whole conversation has sustained me. And I think it's really important for these conversations to occur because this is a fearful. It's not the kind of thing we talk about at dinners or parties, even when the person next to us we know is going through something so very difficult. So I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. I thank all the panelists for taking time out of very, very busy schedules to share their experience and wisdom with all of us. And I hope this is just the beginning of many conversations here at Duke. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dean Broom, Dean Powery. Thanks for opening up this space to us tonight. I'm, I'm Dave Cassaret, the director of the Duke Center for Palliative Care. Um, I'm delighted to be here and even more delighted that all of you have chosen to use this beautiful, surprisingly beautiful February Friday evening to spend with us. Uh, you could be out having a picnic in the Duke Gardens or doing a lot of other things rather than sitting in a dark church talking about death. So thanks for your vote of confidence that uh, at least one person in your group thought that this would be a, a fun way to, to spend the evening. So thank you for that. I'll keep my introduction brief, um, partly because I'm, I'm fighting a cold and I'm not sure how long my voice will last. Uh, also because this isn't a topic that needs a lot of introduction, frankly. Um, it needs a little bit, though, because this isn't something that most of us think about. I think most of us live our lives from day to day thinking long term, thinking about what life will be like 10 years from now, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, and for some kids, probably 100 years from now. We don't think about the point at which that timeline, that journey, is going to end. We think about kids, we think about grandkids, we think about jobs, we think about retirement, but we don't think about what might happen if we don't make it to that point. We don't think about that, we don't ponder it, we don't give it much consideration, because we don't have to, until at some point, all of a sudden, we do. And for everyone in this room, there will come a time, sometimes many times, for us and for family members, when we do need to stop and think and take stock. And we need to come to grips with the realization that we don't have 50 years. We won't live to see great-grandchildren. We may not live to see retirement. We need to be thinking not in terms of the next 50 years, but the next 50 days, uh, or sometimes unfortunately, much less. 
And that's hard to do. It's hard to turn so quickly to be thinking on one hand about what life might be like retired living in Florida with grandkids and then all of a sudden thinking you only have a year or a month or a week and thinking very hard about how to spend that time, what you want to do, what you don't want to do, who you want to spend that time with, who you don't want to spend that time with. That's a tough cognitive challenge for many of us. And that's what this conversation tonight is about, to give us a chance, all of us a chance, to begin thinking about those answers to those questions, hopefully before we need to. And I'm delighted there are many thank yous which we need to get to before the end of the evening, which I will, but one thank you I'll give you now by way of introduction is to the panel sitting to my left, all of whom have had to struggle with some of these questions in their personal or professional lives and volunteered to sit up in front of you tonight and to share what they've learned. Linda Jacobs, to my immediate left, is a wonderful, brave woman whose family is here with her as well, who took care of her husband, as she'll describe, on hospice several years ago, and learned a lot, and did a lot, and accomplished a lot, and she'll tell you some of that story and some of, some of what she's learned along the way. Kimberly Johnson is a friend and colleague, a geriatrician and a palliative care physician here at Duke, who is a wonderful clinician, used to be one of my grandmother's doctors, actually, um, is also a fantastic researcher and one of the most careful thinkers who I've had a privilege to work with here at Duke. Pastor Godby is the pastor of the River Church in South Durham, um, who is an amazing speaker. I had a chance to be on an NPR program with Pastor Godby and with Linda Jacobs last week. Um, was amazed that I had the good fortune to have invited these two wonderful speakers to be on the panel. Uh, that, that show on WNC was truly amazing. Um, to his left, Tony Galanos, um, also a friend and a colleague, a geriatrician and a palliative care physician here at Duke. Uh, one of two people, along with Jennifer Gentry, who's in the back, who started Duke's palliative care program a long, long time ago. Um, an amazing clinician and mentor to many young doctors and nurses out there. And last but not least, Liz Zeconati, who is the nurse practitioner for hospice, Duke's hospice program, who has been responsible almost single-handedly for helping thousands of patients over the years that she's worked with hospice, has made many, many close relationships with hospice patients and their families, and has a lot of wisdom to, to offer. I could say more, but I think you are all here to hear the panelists' stories. And as you do, um, I would encourage you to think about where you are in your own lives, friends, family members. I would encourage you to think about choices that you have made in the past, um, would like to make in the future, to begin thinking about those more critically with the ultimate goal of not being surprised when those questions come knocking on all of our doors. One quick housekeeping issue, I'll ask each of the panelists to speak for somewhere between five and 10 minutes. We won't have much of a break in between, but there'll be time for questions afterwards. I'll ask all the panelists to remain up at the table after they finish speaking at the podium, and then we'll have about a half an hour to 40 minutes, depending on time, for questions and answers. There are note cards. You'll notice in some of the seats in front of you, they may be at one end. Um, there are also pens distributed. As much as we can, we'll use those note cards to organize questions. So if you have questions that come up, please write the panelist's name on the note card and then pass them to the left and uh, one of our, our helpers will collect those. Um, if you don't see a card in front of you, look to your left or look to your right. Um, and if you have some in front of you, please share because that's what this evening is, is all about. So thanks again for being here. And I'd like to introduce Linda to take the stage first. 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 No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me here this evening. And my husband, Gary, and Al's dad uh, was diagnosed with ALS in uh, 2011. And um, we were in complete denial. He was an athletic, energetic business owner who only knew one gear, which was high. And um, we, just, we found it hard to believe that he could be diagnosed with this. So uh, I took his medical records to many doctors, and unfortunately, the diagnosis was true. He uh, 
Immediately, we got our affairs in order, our wills and our financial affairs, and uh, he transitioned slowly from uh, working daily to uh, staying at home. And he slowly was weakening, but most of all, his speech was slurred, so he, uh, he transitioned pretty quickly to home life. And he started preparing us for his departure, basically. He started sending me emails and, uh, on who to call when the water heater breaks, and I have a laminated instructions on how to run the generator. And I had to do monthly checks and make sure it happened. He said, you're going to be sorry. If you don't do that, you're going to be caught without it. So we had to do monthly checks and who to call when the AC breaks and troubleshooting notes and electrical diagrams. I had it all. I literally have a book of emails of what to do and who to call. And he became... Uh, he was home with me and Al and our, all of our animals, and we have a lot of animals. And he was happy there, and um, he could navigate around the house with his walker. And uh, we have a couple of cats who would actually sit on the walker, and he'd push them around. And we have videos of that, too, Jack and Joey. And, um, I mean, he never complained. He was a happy camper. He was the best patient ever to take care of. And... I'm so thankful for that. He was a real gem. And uh, he never intended to have uh, invasive ventilation, but he caught a cold for me, and we ended up in the emergency room one night because he had no airway, and he woke up on a ventilator. So for one month, he was in the uh, neurology ICU, and um, actually his nurses, who took care of him for a month this year, I believe, and... Um, we got him home, and he was just, um, he was wonderful to care for. And we still had, I'm so thankful he went on the ventilator because it gave us another year of good memories and laughs, and we had laughs. I used to shave him every morning, and when I'd get that razor out, he would look at me like I, anyway, we'd have a good laugh. I never, I only nicked him once or twice. I didn't really hurt him. <laughs> Anyway, he was a gem. And there was one, um, we knew we were going to lose him, but we didn't know where it would be, at home or in the hospital. And um, there was uh, one time when he was running a fever from an unknown source, and we had to take him to the emergency room. So we got him in the car, and we were driving down the driveway, and I looked over at him, and he was crying. So he... Um, he didn't think he was going to come home, but we got him home. I said, I'm going to get you home, and we did. And I knew that we needed to keep him home if we could. We, he needed to pass that home with his family, with his animals, and where he was most comfortable. So I began to make calls to find somebody who could help us, and uh, I spoke with uh, Duke Hospice. And they actually sent someone to our house that very afternoon to talk with Gary. And um, Liz uh, helped us and Dr. Turner. And they guided us through the process. And um, we knew when the time came he was ready. And uh, it was uh, Father's Day. It was, uh, and I said, it was Sunday, Father's Day. And... I knew that the next week, Monday, they had scheduled to put the midline in, and then they were going to start the sedation process on Tuesday. So that Sunday before uh, Al came over, and I think they binge-watched uh, uh, <laughs> Eastbound and Down, <laughs> his favorite show. I mean, that's just who he was. He liked laughing. Anyway, they watched TV all day, had a great time, and that was more good memories. And Monday, they put the line in. Tuesday, they started the sedation process. And the good thing about Gary, because he wasn't able to speak, he texted and emailed us. That, and we still have those. And I was looking back through my texts this past week. And um, I have our conversation right up to the last. And um, on Wednesday afternoon, evening, he said, I think that next dose 
is going to knock me out. And we were able to chat through that evening. And one of the last things he said to me was, uh, not Linda, I love you, although we did say that a lot. And by the way, he was my boyfriend since I was 15. We were a high school, high school boyfriend, girlfriend, and stayed. So we basically grew up together. Anyway, the, one of the last few things he was saying was, don't forget the, the uh, furnace is dual fuel and uh, show Al where the drains are out front and on the side. And I mean, those were his last things. And honestly, the last thing, he, the very last thing he said to me in a text was, keep an eye on Pete's lump. He's one of our dogs who had a cyst on his side and he wanted me to make sure I, I kept track of that. But basically what it was like is, if you're going out of town and you make a list for somebody taking care of your house or your pets, he was, I think it's comparable to that. He was making a list for us to look after the house when he wasn't there. And he passed on that Friday morning and uh, Duke Hospice was like a flock of angels there. And it was, uh, it was exactly the type of death. It was a good death for Gary. It was exactly what he wanted. He was home. We were in our living room. He was surrounded by uh, our family, Al and I, and our dogs and cats. And it was very, very peaceful. And it was wonderful, if I could dare say that. And even though it was exactly what he wanted, it was still incredibly hard to let him go. But it was, it was, that is what he wanted. And I'm so thankful that we were able to make that happen for him. I still feel so good about that today. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so that's it, yeah. Good evening. So I've spent a, a good bit of time this week thinking about what is the right story to share in this setting. And as a geriatrician, I've really had the privilege of caring for tons of patients and families at the end of life. And I think many of them have achieved what I might consider a good death, what I really imagined for myself being somewhere between the age of 95 and 105, um, still with my cognition to the extent that I have it now, which is limited, um, and being surrounded by you know, my daughter and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, having the opportunity to say goodbye, knowing they'll miss me, uh, but imagining that when it's all over, there'll be this big party where they'll talk about what a wonderful person I was and what wonderful contributions I made and how inspiring I was. And, you know, I thought of lots of those stories, but the story that really came to mind to share was one of my early experiences with caring for a patient as an attending physician. And I think one that I learned tons from and, and certainly has informed my approach to end of life care for many of the patients I care for now. It was shortly after joining the faculty. It was my first rotation as a general medicine attending. And I took care of a 50 year old woman. We'll call her Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones was a 50 year old lady with cervical cancer. And when I entered the hospital on day number three for, of her hospital stay, it was clear that the team was struggling uh, in caring for her for m many, many reasons. But I think by the end of it, there, there were lots of lessons learned and I've used the story of Mrs. Jones and lots of my teachings about end of life care to some of our uh, more junior trainees. Mrs. Jones had actually been diagnosed about two years before I met her, and at the time of her diagnosis, her cancer had already spread. She was 48 at the time. She actually recalled having some symptoms that were probably due to her cancer for about two years, but she didn't seek help. Uh, she admits that one, she was afraid, and two, she actually had no medical insurance. 
After she was diagnosed, she underwent uh, some of the usual therapies. She uh, had a hysterectomy. She got chemotherapy. She had radiation therapy. She actually did well for about a year, but the burden of her cancer increased. She developed some pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, as is the case here at Duke, she was seen in our clinic, and so she went on a clinical trial of a new drug. Um, she wasn't able to take it very long because she continued to have progression of her disease, was not able to eat or drink. And she went to see her oncologist after stopping the drug. The oncologist explained that there were no more options for life prolonging therapies, and at that point suggested that she consider focusing on comfort for whatever time was left and enrolling in hospice. She really became angry. She stormed out of the office, never to return again, and said, I'm not going to hospice because I'm not dying, and that's where they put you to die. Before I met her, she had been home for about three months, being cared for by a huge church family um, and her husband. And she came to the hospital only because just the burden of pain, nausea, and vomiting had gotten so bad. She was admitted with a bowel obstruction. And when I went to see her on the first day of my rotation, uh, I walked in and the room was filled with people from her church, including her pastor, and they were praying at the bedside and I stood there present for the prayer. Afterwards, they left and I sat by her bedside and we started talking. Um, I asked how she was doing and her immediate was response was, I know you think I have cancer, but I don't. So I really don't want to talk about that part. Um, she said, you know, what I want is for you to do your part and God will do the rest. And your part is to help these young doctors figure out what's really wrong with me. And so in talking to the team uh, about this over the next several days of her uh, hospitalization, we did what doctors do. You know, when patients don't believe us, we actually attempt to provide them evidence that really we know what we're talking about and they don't. And so we came up with this idea that we would actually convince her that in fact this was all about her cancer. And so we brought in MRI scans, we had the surgeons coming, there were x-rays and lab reports. Uh, and the more we provided information, the more her responses actually focused on what was important to her, and that was her faith. I remember us talking about um, controlling her symptoms and her saying God is able. We talked about the fact that if time were short, how would you like to spend it? You have some children who live far away. What would be your goals around that? And she said to us, you know, God is able. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. I remember one, um, particularly, you know, it's just really something that has stuck with me. We were as a team at her bedside, and one of the interns was talking to her, and he said to her, you know, I know that you would like for us to perform a miracle, but we won't be able to do that. Now, I was struck by that because I have never performed a miracle, Reverend. <laughs> and so she looked at him and she said, of course you can't perform a miracle. People like you can't do things that are impossible, but God can. And over the course of several days, you know, believe it or not, we eventually get it. So, I, you know, I think she wore us down or maybe we just wised up. And, you know, we stopped talking and showing her x-rays and we actually started listening. We learned a lot about Mrs. Jones. You know, we learned about the fact that she had had some bad experiences with health care, uh, that she had had a number of difficulties and challenges in her life, and that it was her faith that always saw her through, and that faith was going to see her through this as well. We learned that she had children that she loved and a husband that she loved, animals at home, and a church family uh, that was really large, a pastor who was quite involved. And as we talked about next steps, you know, she told us that she was sure that she was going to get better and that she'd like to be doing that at home rather than in the hospital. We talked about ways to do that and, and we were brave, so we briefly mentioned the H word again, knowing that we were on shaky ground. But this time we didn't talk about hospice as a service for someone who was dying or at the end of their life. We actually talked about how hospice would help her to live at home and help to take care of her because she was also concerned about potential burden on her family. And she thought, well, this is great. 
I remember as she left the hospital, uh, there were really some concerns about the fact that I had not discussed with her whether or not she wanted to be resuscitated. It was clear to me that she didn't want to discuss whether or not she was going to be resuscitated because she was actually not going to die. She wouldn't need resuscitation. And so um, I, as she walked out, she smiled at me and she waved and she said, I know you don't believe it, but God is not finished with me yet. And she died two days after she left the hospital at home. She didn't come back to the hospital. And I can tell you that there were some bets about whether that would happen. Um, about a month later, a little bit over a month later, I actually contacted her husband, as, as has often been my practice after uh, I care for someone who dies to contact the family. And I talked to him and I, I really apologized for our care and I said to him that I really wish that she had more good time. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, time where her symptoms were better controlled and she had time with her family. And he said to me that there was good time and that this happened just as it was meant to happen. He said, my, my wife was a woman of faith and she believed, and as I do, that God's will was done. And I think, you know, in thinking about the case of Mrs. Jones, there, uh, there are many things that I learned, but some of the things that really come to mind um, are, number one, that death is messy. So I had this idea from my mentor, Tony Galanos, that I could wrap everything up in a nice package and tie it with a bow. But that just really didn't happen. You know, I also learned that this thing that, I, that we often envision about a good death is not what everyone else envisions as a good death. Uh, I remember doing a presentation with Jennifer at one of the meetings, really kind of inspired by this, where we decided to think about uh, a title, and we entitled our presentation, Whose Death Is It Anyway? Because sometimes, I think as clinicians, we own it a little bit more than we need to. The other piece is, you know, I really learned about this variability and approach to end-of-life care. My, my husband would remind me as I bring up topics of death at dinner that really it's not appropriate and everybody is not as comfortable with the death and dying as you are, Kim. And so uh, he would also say that for some people, the, the right way to die is to not die at all or at least not to acknowledge that that might happen. Um, and so I think that was the case. And finally, I really learned something about really being present with patients and families who are dying and that process being about acknowledging their beliefs, finding a way to really align with their hopes. And as hard as it is for physicians actually not expect to lead, but actually to walk beside and sometimes behind um, in that process. That's difficult, right? Because my decision-making and approach is often informed by my scientific knowledge, which I you know, tell patients now that I don't know everything, something I learned later. Uh, <laughs> and acknowledge that there are many things that I don't understand. Uh, but I think it, it, you know, it's also about learning to be with people whose decisions are informed by something that I might not understand, their interpretation of their faith, and really how that impacts their vision of what their last days might be like. So thanks for the opportunity. So Dr. Johnson, I'll be working miracles right over here to the right. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kasserit, I truly appreciate the opportunity to uh, engage in this discussion. You know, uh, from a faith-based context, everybody wants to go to heaven, just nobody wants to die to get there. And so this is one of the things that we try to normalize and help people to understand that death is just as much a part of life as anything. So after 29 years of preaching and giving my life to care for others, I'm sure you're shocked right now because you say, hey, he's only 29 years old. No. Uh, uh, uh. But after 29 years of committing my life uh, to sometimes some of the most difficult moments in humanity, I had to find a way to normalize death. And so I could really separate from this moment and talk about some of the different people that I've had to deal with, but I wanted to bring it home just a little bit closer. Oh, can't hear me. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Great. We're on sprint. Good. Okay. So, so 
what I needed to do was I needed to make this very personal. And so I needed to talk about a man that came here six years ago to watch his apple of his eye and the love of his life one day graduate and attend Duke University. That's my wife's dad. Six years ago, he came to North Carolina to live with us. And he came with hopes of discovering and finding new life that he might end his days with his family. 29 years of preaching and giving my life to helping people. I needed to, in some way, normalize this thing called death for my family the same way that I found peace and understanding that it's just as much as part of life as anything else. And so my wife and I made up in our minds that it would be the greatest thing to have dad come and live with us and just give ourselves to caring for him for the remainder of his life, whatever amount of time that would be. This man who could barely read but had given 20 years of his life to working at GM and had spent all of his years building Cadillacs, never owned one, but came to live here to end his life. He came here and we found it just such a great joy to have him a part of our lives and to have him in our homes and in our home and to know that we were going to spend the rest of his days caring for him. And so he seemingly found just strength and energy and found this fresh wind after 60 years of marriage, losing the love of his life. He came here and found hope and found life and found joy again. Well, we're going down this path and dad is now in North Carolina and looking like he's going to uh, have the thing that he hoped for and the thing that he prayed for and that is to one day watch his baby girl graduate and, and attend Duke University. And it's not the way things went. Dad went home to be with the Lord and I want to just tell you a little bit about what that looked like. It was a moment for us that being caregivers really connected us into the lineage and legacy of what was being left to us as a family. It was an opportunity for our children to serve their granddad. It was an opportunity for them to bathe him and to change his diapers. It was an opportunity for them to hear him impart into them and speak wisdom and tell them the stories and the things that he wanted to leave with them. It almost seemed unfair that he got to craft this narrative and create this moment that he could actually define his last days. And so we brought our children into this moment, teaching them that every moment that you get to spend with granddad is an investment that you're making into your future and your destiny. What we were also doing was preparing them for one day they would have to take care of us. We wanted to normalize this thing in our homes so that they wouldn't be afraid to embrace it, that they wouldn't be a part of that crowd that believe that faith in some way keeps death away from your door. But we wanted them to know that the faith that we have takes us up to that door called death and takes us into our eternal reward. We want to take this opportunity to show them that this is not a conversation that we have to be afraid to have, that this is not an experience that we've got to ignore and act like it's not there. But faith is what keeps us, and faith is what galvanizes us as a family and what helps us wake up in the middle of the night when he's calling out. And now dad is going into dementia, and his beautiful daughter, who is the love of his life and and the, the sparkle in his eye is now gone from what we laugh about in our house, Carla, to Carl. In the middle of the night, he's calling out. And he doesn't know her name anymore. And it's not Carla, it's Carl. 
He doesn't call me Ronald anymore. He calls me the Ronald Ronald, the other Ronald. And he's deteriorating right in front of our face. But in the midst of this, we found strength because we found out how to come together and we found out as a family how to help him in those moments and how to gather around him and how to walk him through one of the most difficult parts of his life. And in that moment, we found a beautiful place as a family. We found a place that we found out what faith really was. It was that there's this thing called faith to die. And our children discovered that there is another part, another component of faith, and that is faith to die. And so as we walk down this road together and as we pull together as a family, and as we went down this journey, dad came to a point where he was going to do it like he wanted to do it. He was going to do it on his own terms. And so as hospice is bringing things in, we're trying to keep stuff away from him and, you know, not tell him, hey, dad, you're in the hospice care. And, you know, things have sort of taken a turn and, you know, uh, they, they've gone down a path that we didn't expect. But for some strange reason he makes this correlation that this new chair that they're bringing into our home you know you got to understand dad was a marine dad didn't like anything in his environment out of array out of order he wanted everything neat he wanted everything perfect and pristine and to inject anything in his environment was to just like ruin the day and they bring this chair in and we're like cool at least it's a new chair but dad doesn't want to sit in that chair like, why don't you want to sit in the chair, Dad? It's going to help you out, man. It's going to make things easy. He says, no, nah, I'm not sitting in that chair. And so as we try to get him to be encouraged about this new chair, he sits there in that chair for just a moment. Then he tells my wife, he says, this is the last time I'm sitting in this chair. Tomorrow, I'm sitting over there, but I'm not sitting in this chair. And Dad then seemingly shuts down as we put him in his bed and he goes into what was a comatose state. Went from being fully alert to just going into a place where he wasn't responding. And so as we began to walk our children down this path and normalize this conversation and show them, hey, this is what we do, this is what believers do, this is where we are. We wanted our children to have a normal moment, so our oldest went on their way and they went about their day, and we sat around and we told jokes about dad all day. We wanted to laugh. We wanted to make it normal. We wanted to make it real. And so dad does it his way. He waits. He waits for everybody to get back home. He waits for everybody to get back in that house. And as we're all back together, he does it on his terms. He does it in his way. He shows us what faith is. He waits till his favorite day, which was Sunday. He had stayed in that state all day Saturday, and he stayed in that place all day Saturday, but he waited over into 1 o'clock in the morning. Now everybody's home. It's Sunday. It's his favorite day. Me and my wife said, hey, he's going to do this on his own terms, and that's what he did. When everybody's in the house, my baby girl, who he wanted to see graduate, and walk into Duke, walks into his room at 1.11 in the morning on Sunday, pats him on the head and says, good night, granddad. And he takes his last breath. I pray that you feel that pause because God has in some way invited you into a profound moment into our lives because that man didn't get to watch her come to Duke. But tonight, I talk about that great man in this great institution. And so that's what faith is. 
doesn't always work out the way that we would have it to work out in our minds, but in some way we wrap ourselves around God and trust that his perfect will has been done. And so this is what faith looks like from a faith-based context. It does not keep us from dying. It helps us normalize it. And it helps us understand that it is just as much a part of living as anything else. God bless you. I think most of y'all can tell the difference between a prepared remarks and unprepared. Uh, I've asked Dr. Cassaret to quickly pass the tray so that the speakers can have dinner tonight. I love this place. I love this university. I was a kid when I came here from Mobile, Alabama, and remember over there by Stonehenge, my mother crying so hard because they were going to leave me at college. And back then, you left your kid for a semester. There were no cell phones or email, and you went home at Christmas. So it was, uh, I love being in here because I don't know how I learned this, but I used to just walk. I'm Greek Orthodox. We have nothing to do with places like this. And um, it's okay to laugh. And uh, <laughs> I, I would walk to the chapel and go sit. I have my own pew back there. And sometimes there would be organ music playing. I find it very soothing. And I told the reverend when I met him just a few moments ago, this is a sacred place. All of us know it, regardless of our faith background. I've been at Duke since uh, 1989, the second time as a, as a doctor. And... Uh, I tried this week, I sat down with Kimberly Johnson the other day. There's so many stories, I can't even categorize them anymore. And that's a great privilege. I think each story gives me energy to do it better the next time. And all the stories I heard uh, prior to my coming up here, I still learned something. I think the point that my new friend made about it doesn't matter how well you're prepared. It doesn't matter how many hospice nurses come to your house. This is hard. And it's the hardest thing you're going to ever do. And I, I was telling Kimberly, I can't count the number of patients and families who've said, you do this every day, but this is only my first time or my second time. And... Uh, you know, you're a doctor and you have on a white coat, but I'm, I'm struggling with losing my dad. And um, I respect so much the journey that patients and families go through. And I guess that's why we're here tonight, because it is hard. And you hope that you have faith. You hope your family stays together. But, you know, we get called when families are tearing apart because there's a critical illness and we get called because human emotions are raw around the end of life. And sometimes you just have to think to yourself, while well, you got on your white coat and you're on the ninth floor at Duke North, I'm in the chapel right now and it's their moment, not mine, and I'm gonna calm down. And regardless of much, how much they scream and holler, I'm gonna be calm because it's their moment, not mine. And that has helped me so much. And like the Reverend, uh, and Kimberly, I was her mentor, but when she got to be such a big shot, we've, we've turned it around. And it's good to see your children grow up and be so successful. So if anybody wants to talk about minorities and end of life, please call Kimberly Johnson. She has plenty of time. <laughs> but my, I, like the Reverend, you know, you can be intellectual, you can be academic, you can do the Duke thing, or you can not prepare your comments because you want to see what happens. And my sister came up while I was sitting there. And like most people who have cancer, it was not a one-year thing or a three-year thing. Cancer when I was in med school and AIDS when I was in med school meant you died and you died soon. Now, if you have cancer or you have AIDS, for example, these are outpatient illnesses. 
and they go on for years. And that's a great thing. It's a great thing. So when my sister was coping with breast cancer, she's a clinical social worker. She processed all of her feelings and a lot of other things. And what she wanted me to do was not be her brother, but to be the second doctor. And uh, she was in Alabama with her family and the rest of my extended family. And she would call often. We don't know how much of a burden it is to have cancer. And I tell you why, I figured it out. No one can tell you what next week is gonna be like. When her husband had ALS, there was not a doctor on the planet, not even my friend Richard Bedlock, who could say, okay, next Wednesday, you're gonna experience this. That's crap, nobody can do it. Oh, I'm in the chapel. Uh, <laughs> sorry, mom. <laughs> uh, um, so she would get a twinge of this or that and call me. And what, there's, I've got some of my medical students here. What do you think she asked me? You think it's the cancer? Everything that happened. And one time, that little rib pain that I was blowing off as musculoskeletal turned out to be a new reoccurrence of metastatic disease. Okay, so now you're torn. Do I trust those guys in Alabama and all that? Or do we come to Duke? So I asked her, what do you want to do? As your brother, not your doctor, what would you like to do? And so she came and she lived with me. Uh, I live in Chapel Hill, it's a long story. And uh, I work at Duke. And she came and stayed at my house. And I loved your point. My best friend, another Kimberly, has had a wonderful Labrador named Kirby. And she said, do you wanna borrow Kirby while Flora's at your house? So Kirby came and was this incredible animal that had the emotional IQ of animals is far superior to most oncologists and radi radiation. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just picking on my friends. This dog was great. So as you know, or wouldn't be standing here, the story progresses. And here's the beauty of being involved at Duke and training a lot of people. The doctor who used to be my intern was now the most famous breast cancer doctor, and all she took care of were patients with stage four. And so the good news about that is you know you're gonna get aggressive state-of-the-art care. The bad news is if you're a paleotrician, will she know when to take her foot off the gas pedal? Will my sister know? Will her idiot husband know? Will my lawyer brother, who's on the internet searching everything and writing it all, there are so many variables. We forget what patients and families go through that is so taxing and emotionally taxing. So to fast forward and, and stay within my lane, we get to this point where it has recurred and it's now in both lungs, her brain, and a few other spots uh, at that, once you get to that point, you know, how many does, does it matter? And Dr. B, I'll call her, and my sister have a meeting, and Dr. B said exactly what Dr. Cassaret said in the beginning and what you've heard from these very sensitive, caring people. If time is short, where do you want to spend it? And my sister said, well, obviously, I need to go home. I have two kids in high school and et cetera. I would go home. And Kim said, if you want to drive back to Alabama, here's our moment. Wow, an oncologist saying, if this is what you value, do this now. Someone was trying to predict what next week was going to be like, and it was this famous, well-known breast oncologist. My sister got up and hugged her and thanked her, and then the oncologist cried. <laughs> the oncologist cried, not my sister because she was still a social worker. She needed that role and she, she was the best at it. So she comforted Dr. B and um, then we walked out and she gave her husband instructions, except verbally, because we're Greek and we talk like that. And she said, load the card, you know, just the ultimate mom and uh, uh, sat in that 
van for a long ride home to Alabama because uh, anyway, they didn't stop. Last part of the story. So now we're back home in my parents' home in Alabama, and my parents have died um, several years before this. So we're in my parents' home. The bed is in the den. She's enrolled in hospice. Hospice is doing a great job with the two teenagers because teenagers and death do not go together. So I should do that. And it's really hard. And then my brothers had a hard time. I'm struggling a little bit because I can't believe out of the four of us, the best one is dying first. It makes no sense. So I would do the night shift and my son would sleep nearby and my sister would wake up and she would say, I'm going to say it in Greek because it's beautiful. Nathelo nakaturisi. I got to pee. And uh, I spoke Greek in the Duke Chapel. I love it. <laughs> she said, Nathelo nakaturisi. And so she was swollen through edema and, and, and swelling. And I, frankly, I could not lift her by myself. So I'd go wake up my son. He would come. She would always cover her backside. The dignity of people dying, they still want it. And she would say, don't look at my, don't look at my colo. That means butt. Don't look at my colo. Don't look at my colo. So I said, it's too late. I just took a picture. It's on the Internet. <laughs> this is the most famous colo in Greek history. The hospice colo. And we, we had a lot of laughs, and uh, she said, if I could hit you, I would. And then, you know, we have people who are caregivers. You put your loved one on, on the, the porter toilet that hospice provides, and then nothing happens. The terrible urge, but they can't do it. And then what do they do? They apologize to you. I'm so sorry you got up, Nick, and you... I said, don't worry about it. We had one conversation that I wanted to share, and I, I'm mindful of the time. She couldn't drink coffee. It would make her throw up. But she loved the smell of coffee. And I've heard that this is common amongst pay. So I would make the coffee, and it was just the two of us. It was, like I said, I had the night shift. So this is somewhere between 2 and 5 in the morning. And she wanted to talk. And I think part of why we're having this session tonight so that we're not afraid to talk to people who are dying. Actually, we don't have to say anything. Just be like the Labrador and listen. And so she asked me, did you ever think about which one of us would die first? And we both immediately said my older brother, Chris, because we think he should. <laughs> and, uh, and we laughed about it, right? He's a, he's a lawyer. He's, his, his emotional IQ was not... so. We laughed about that, and I said, frankly, Flora, I thought you would be last. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Does it make sense? You can have hospice. You can have me. It still is hard. This is 2008. I'm still doing this. So I want to compliment the patients and their courage and their direction with the family. We underestimate. We think it's about us. It's their moment, not ours. And thank you for the privilege of being here. My name is Liz, and like Dr. Kasserett said, I, I work in hospice. Um, for the last four years, I've, um, I've done hospice work, but the story that I'm going to tell tonight is from when I worked as an oncology nurse um, at Duke. And on this particular unit that I worked on, uh, we cared for our patients for long periods of time, you know, 30, 40 days. And we would get to know our patients and their families really well. And I had taken care of this young man uh, many times. He was in his early 30s. And it's one particular night that I went in to see him um, 
do his assessment and take him his medicine. He looked very different to me. Um, he, he was very sick and he was struggling uh, with every breath. And I, like a determined nurse, was trying to get him to take his medicine. And he was wearing a, a mask to help him breathe. And I was picking out the most important pills. And I remember he looked up at me with total exhaustion and said no. And I remember it was really, it was noisy. It was loud in his room. His mother was next to him in a recliner and she was really into this, the program that was on, I think it was American Idol. And she wasn't paying any attention to our conversation. And I had asked her if we could turn the TV off for just a second so I could hear him better. And she did. And it became really quiet in the room and you could hear him gasping and it was really powerful to hear him and I asked him again if he could take his pills and he said again he said no and my sense was that he was saying no to everything else to not just the pills and his mom began to cry and I think she realized at that time that he was very sick and that this wasn't going to end like they had hoped in the beginning and as she's crying, I, I just stood there and I didn't really know what to do other than ask him what he wanted, what we could do for him. And he simply replied, my kids. And I, I left the room and I was right outside in the hall charting and I could hear his mom crying. And after about, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes, she came out of the room and she was no longer crying and she looked really focused and determined to get his kids there which she told me would be a challenge because they were in school and they lived with his ex-wife in another state. She described his ex-wife as being challenging. <laughs> and, but she was really determined and she did it. She coordinated the kids to get there and they arrived the next day and he died the following day after they had arrived. And I have thought about him and that very brief moment that we shared and how powerful it was, how, how it shifted everything and how he took what little time he had to tell us what he needed most, which was his children. And as a nurse, it felt, it felt really good to help him get the thing that he wanted, his kids, so he could say goodbye. And, um, and that always stuck with me. That's all. Thank you.
Thanks again to all of our panelists. I, I should have said at the outset, but I'll, I'll say now, it's probably more meaningful now. I, I didn't ask them to follow a structure or a format. I didn't offer any coaching. I didn't try to control or micromanage what they were going to say. I trusted that if they told stories from their personal experience and if they spoke from the heart, that they would give us valuable lessons. And uh, one of the, the smartest things I've, I've done recently, actually, is to, to trust them to do that. And I, I hope that you'll agree that it worked out much better than it would have if I had tried to, to manage it myself. So thanks to all of you for being willing to stand up here and, and tell your stories. Um, I think people will be coming around to collect um, cards, but somebody, um, before I, I get those, one question uh, was handed to me virtually when I came in. wasn't so much of a, a question as a, a criticism. Um, somebody on my way in collared me, and uh, this is a question for all of you, by the way, and asked me um, why we were calling this event a good death. Because the whole idea of a good death is stupid. Death can never be good. Death is always, to some degree, uncomfortable, sad, difficult. Talking about a good death is like talking about a good basketball loss against UNC. There's just no such thing. Um, and so that's a question I'd like to ask you to, to take a, a swing at, if, if anybody would like to, while we're waiting for questions to come up. Is that um, a stupid thing to think about? Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? You have lapel mics, which should work. We'll see if, if tech helps us out. I mean, I could answer that. I mean, I, I really think that we knew we were going to lose Gary, and the fact that we were able to make it happen exactly how he wanted it to happen made it a good death. I mean, there's a 100% chance we're all going to go, and we don't know how, but we did know how we were going to lose him, and it was, it couldn't have been scripted better, and it was a beautiful experience. Sad, but it was really beautiful. Other thoughts? And it's truly, you know, the inevitable, and at some point, we, we must find the beauty in it. And there is beauty in death. You know, um, as much as we lose, uh, there's so much that the other individual gains, especially when looking at it from a faith context. You know, it, it is absolutely amazing that we are not left to suffer eternally. But there is a release. And to understand that our loved ones are no longer suffering in that way, for me, it helps me to reconcile it. Was was that my husband who handed that to you? <laughs> <laughs> it was was actually one of my grandmother's friends from the forest. <laughs> because he would agree with that, that this idea of a good death just really doesn't exist. I think that it's language, uh, you know, certainly uh, made popular early on by Karen Steinhauser and, and others with the idea not that it's such that it's a good thing, but really understanding uh, what patient and family preferences are for that period. And so I don't know what we call it, uh, but I certainly, the, the idea that it's, that, it, that it's not entirely good or certainly not what we might think of as good resonates with me, but I think thinking of, of ways to make it consistent with people's preferences and goals when they're able to express those. Uh, makes it more tolerable. Yeah. So one question from a new healthcare provider, um, which I think could be answered by any or, or all of you, um, is what suggestions would you have for healthcare providers to do a better job than we currently do now uh, in caring for family members? How can we better support family members? How can we better care for them, both as family members and caregivers? Tony, you want to take a swing at that first? Well, uh, Kimberly's story said it best. Uh, close your mouth and start listening is 
one, I say it more strongly when I teach, and um, two is respect where the patient's coming from. I think Dr. Johnson's story was illustrative of the very common refrain, uh, you seem to be a nice person, but we're waiting for the miracle. And if the worst possible thing you can say in that moment, and that's how I teach it, if I have a hundred, if I'm with a few med students and I said, so what's the worst thing you can say right then? And they all get it. You would say, if you wanted to really cut off communication, uh-uh, no such thing as miracles. So that immediately helps people start to respect the perspective of the, of the I love your story because eventually you, well, you always do, but your team came to respect uh, that lady's perspective about faith and end of life care. And then I think just the notion, I hope my story was more about the family. We need to, uh, of course, David knows this, in palliative care, the unit of care is the patient and the family. And to be, uh, I love Liz's story because that is a good death. It would have been a horrible death if he died without his kids. Yeah. And yet you turned what is a terribly sad situation into tolerable because the right people were there that he, he wanted. So I think just listening, which is what Liz did. Of course, she kept trying to stick the pills down his mouth, but that's nursing. No, kidding. Sorry, Dean. Uh, uh, she was doing her job, and then she went from doing her job to being Liz and just started listening. And I think for the young providers in the room, that's the lesson. It's not what you know. It's what you, what you heard from your patient. Other thoughts? So there's another question that I, I really love. It's, it's actually for Linda, but I'll also give others a chance to, to answer it as well, because I think you'd all have perspectives. Actually, several questions for you, which I'll share later. We may not have time to get to all of them, but this one I love. Um, is there one thing you feel really good about? Um, maybe something really small that you were able to do for Gary, your family were able to do for Gary, something that you feel really proud of that, that seemed to make a difference? Well. Gary didn't leave the house because it was difficult for him to do that, but um, one thing he really enjoyed doing was going to see Al play hockey. So Sunday night was hockey night and we would load him up and first it was, he was pushing a walker, then it was a wheelchair and then eventually a wheelchair and a ventilator. But we got him there and he enjoyed that so much. So that was our, our big night. Sunday night out and like I said we didn't ever go anywhere so Sunday night was a big deal for us and I mean he loved his son obviously so that was a good time for us. Great. Yeah, I'm struck that so many of the things that we do as family caregivers are routine, they're prosaic, they're changing diapers, they're helping with transfers, they're dealing with medications by way of pill pack, trips to Walgreens in the middle of the night, but we do other things that are really meaningful. Do you all have things that either you've seen or done that may seem little trivial but really made a difference? Yeah, I know for us uh, caring for dad, I mean, what a privilege it was to be able to tend to every need, you know. Uh, here's a man that gave his life and committed it to meeting every need of his family. And now we get to return the favor and to watch my wife, you know, literally move at every beck and call. I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but she lost 15 pounds in the middle of caring for dad because we had monitors in his room and every call because he would think that he went to sleep, but he'd get up 15 minutes later and call her. And every time I would tell her, you know, dad just used the restroom, he should be good. No, she would run down those stairs. And 15, 20 times a night, she ran up and down the stairs to meet every need. And again, what a privilege that is to be able to do that for him. I'll just say that in hospice, you know, it's all about the little things, the simple things, um, personal hygiene, um, 
providing a peaceful, serene environment, having music and pets and creating this very calming environment. And while the hospital does many things very well, um, sometimes people come out with very dirty hair, teeth that haven't been brushed. Um, and one thing that I think is really moving is that we, patients get out of their hospital gowns and they put clothes on and their hair is washed and they look like a little bit more like themselves. And it's really meaningful for families to see that. And it's the very basic things. I heard someone consider it, it's um, low tech, high touch care. And, um, and I think that it's something that we lose sight of when we're busy um, keeping people alive. And when we can focus on other things, we can um, really make a difference. And um, I think that families really appreciate seeing their loved ones clean, the moist mouth and in their jammies, and it's really wonderful. This, this is not a question that somebody asked, but it's one that, that occurred to me as, as you all were talking. Pretty much every conversation involved hospice, um, including, Liz, what you just said about everything that hospice can do for patients and families. And yet, I think my panelists all know, but you as audience members may not, that the median length to stay in hospice, at Duke Hospice, is a little over a week. So half of people enroll in hospice in the last week of life. So all of these benefits of hospice you've been hearing about, people really only get access to for the last hours, days, sometimes weeks, but often not. I, I'm wondering if anybody wanted to quickly give a summary of, of why that might be. Hospice took care of Gary for a good month, I think. Right, Liz? Yeah, yes. I mean, Liz um, came that very day that I called for help, and we didn't know how it was going to happen, how it would play out, but we just knew we needed help, and we needed to start getting information. And um, Liz and um, Danielle, who was our nurse, and Dr. Turner were all there every time we needed them. and. Actually, the day before uh, Gary passed that Thursday, they were with him from morning until midnight because he had a, a bit of a rough day, but they got him through it. And they took care of him for a month or would have been there as long as we needed them, I think. I think hospice is too final mm -hmm. for the lay public. Plus, when hospice first started in this country, their marketing was horrible because they wanted to be outside of the medical establishment and now it's part of what is fabric. It's not outside of anything. So when people think, um, like Dr. Johnson said in her story, the H word can sometimes galvanize a patient and family against you because they think you want the story to end when in fact what you're trying to do is have quality time at home, we were lucky because my sister knew a lot about hospice as a social worker, and she was in hospice from January through March at home. And I tell you, they were extraordinary, but I have to credit my sister for having the courage and the insight to know this is how I best serve my children. And I think the social worker in hospice, which we rarely talk about, the chaplain came and he was a good guy. The daily nurse was extraordinary. She did personal care. The nurse nurse who was on the beeper was great, but the social worker and her intervention with the teenagers was extraordinary. And her work still goes on because those two kids have, uh, that, this is roughly eight years ago, those two kids have done fine. And I really think her intervention as the hospice social worker was the key. I think also it's not just too final for patients and families, it's too final for clinicians. Yeah. Right? The way you get to hospice is a doctor or, you know, someone refers you. And so um, 
as we all understand that when you sign on to hospice, basically you are electing care focused on comfort in lieu of life prolonging therapies. That's really hard for clinicians too often to admit that they're not life prolonging therapies available and to have the conversations with patients and families that lead them to actually then sign on to hospice. And so, you know, I usually like to blame the patient and family, but you know, tonight I was going to take some <laughs> some credit for the fact that I think clinicians are often a bigger barrier uh, than patients and families. So it's a perfect segue. Um, talking about barriers, I think many of us would say, uh, hopefully there aren't too many physicians in this room. Sometimes physicians are the barrier, either because we see optimism ahead or we know all of the potential treatments that we could bring to bear or we're attached to a patient and just don't want to give up. So this is one question which I'm gonna take some liberties with, but hopefully I'll get the, the gist of it, which is um, how do we, whether we're patients or families, this question actually was coming from a nurse, how do we encourage, would be one verb, I could think of other verbs, but how could we encourage physicians to be more honest, more direct in talking about prognosis um, and in talking about what's appropriate treatment and, and what's not. How do we begin to address that barrier? Any ideas? It's probably the hardest question I've given you so far. It'll get easier. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's really about a, a culture change. Um, it's funny, my grandmother, when, when my grandmother learned that I was a geri going to become a geriatrician, she thought, well, that was great. You know, I could take care of older adults like her. And her thing was, yes, now you can help me live a long time, even though I have diabetes and hypertension. When she learned that I was interested in this palliative care and hospice, she thought, well, you know, you really are wasting your, t your time, energy, and money with that. And she said, is that why you went to medical school? I thought it was because you wanted to help people live longer, not actually help people to die. Is that what you do now? <laughs> and so, you know, I think that even though my grandmother said that, it's very much a part of medical culture. We go to medical school to help people live longer, everything almost, except for the few things, times when Dr. G shows up, that we learn is really about prolonging life. Only recently have we actually started to learn how to talk to patients and families about dying and prognosis. And so I think you know, it's, it's not what we're taught to do most of the time. Uh, and we also are just a general part of American culture, which is pretty, uh, not, uh, pretty death deny in many respects. One quick thought, the church and advanced care planning makes a lot of sense. So if your doc is not on board, maybe you and your family are. I mean, y'all did a family intervention. Yes, sir. And then the other thing that we've learned in palliative care is not talk about end of life, but focus on pain and symptom management, which are safe areas and avenues. I like you, you've nodded at everything I've said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, the non-threatening piece of, oh, we can help your patient who's been nauseated for days to weeks. So I think that's how we kind of change the culture. Uh, Kimberly, of course, is right. You gotta change the culture, and I think that's been our focus. Something safe, like symptom management, as opposed to end of life. Um, one thing, um, I always felt like, as a bedside nurse, um, we had the luxury of time with our patients. Um, and I think that's very valuable um, because the time that you have is when you see change, when they're not doing as well, they're not eating, they're not getting out of bed. The docs are busy, they're moving in and out of these rooms quickly. And I think more collaboration with a bedside nurse who has been there and seen what they're not able to do that they could do last week would be very valuable because I think nurses do hold a lot of information about change in a patient and they know their patients very well. And I will tell you that I have had patients that I've cared for who are vomiting and two minutes before a doctor walks in, they put a baseball cap on, brush their teeth and put makeup on mm -hmm. and, and they say they're fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
because they want to look good, they want to be good, and they want their physician to think that they are doing well. And they let the nurse see them sick. And, um, and so I, that's what I would say. Thanks. We're close to 7 o'clock. We have time for one more question, um, which I'm going to make into a two-part question to give you all a chance to, to weigh in and, and let folks know what you, what you think. Um, it, the two-part question goes something like this. To use Tony's analogy of, of a half an hour ago, knowing when to take the foot off the gas pedal, when is it time to start backing off? When is it time to start focusing more on comfort, more on using the time you have rather than extending that time? How do you know? How does a patient know? How does a family know? Um, and the second part of that question, if this is easier to tackle, um, how do you start telling your family or your healthcare provider that it's time? I can take that one. Yeah. Um, Gary had good days and bad days, and um, he said many times, I don't know how much longer I can do this, and that was hard for me to hear, and we usually had a good cry, and the moment would pass, but um, he, I was reading a text, actually, that he sent me uh, and said, uh, it's incredibly difficult the suctioning in the ventilator makes me so uncomfortable and I'm so exhausted when it's done. And he said, the sooner that um, we go forward with this, the sooner the healing will begin for you and Al. And he knew he was ready and he actually picked his day. I mean, he was removed on the ventilator at home uh, under sedation and he picked his day and he knew he was ready and I always promised him that we would honor his wishes as difficult as it was but he told us when he was ready and we were able to make that happen for him. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. other, other thoughts or advice for the audience? How do you know and how do you communicate that to family? I like talking about plan A Plan A is always where the patient gets better. The kids are here. The pastor came, said, oh, you look so good, I'm going to go see some sick people. That, that's plan A. And, and then we talk about plan B, so that uh, we're hoping for the best and planning for the worst at the same time, so that it's not a surprise, it's not a threat. And if you start that language early, families actually like you, and when it's time to discuss it, they're, they don't run. I think um, it's, it's a judgment call, and then you've got to have the humility to say, oh, I think I was wrong. And um, it is definitely a judgment call. The best part of the story I said about my dear sister was I never would have predicted that oncologist could have made that call because she's very aggressive. And she was beautiful. She nailed it that we've done X, Y, and Z, plan A did not work. What's your plan B? And then, because we had already been talking like that, the patient said, gotta get back to Alabama. Not many people say that. I gotta get back to Alabama. You <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Now I wanna get back to the chapel. I've already given my kids strict instructions. And, uh, but that, as you know, David, that's, that's the hardest part. And in today's world, whether you're talking with your nursing colleagues, something comes up and you walk in the room and there's a kid with a laptop doing the latest research and saying, you know, at MD Anderson or University of California, San Francisco, there's a trial. And I think it's hard on patients and families to know because there's too much data out there that extends hope. Mm -hmm. One of the things I try to, try to do is actually to always uh, have patients and families to remind me of the goal. And so when the treatment can no longer meet that goal, I think it's yeah. time to get off the gas pe pedal. And so if the goal of the treatment was to prolong life and that uh, treatment is no longer doing that, it seems that we shouldn't be doing that. 
um, or if 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 I, I often talk about the burdens of treatment compared to what people might want to achieve, and and certainly most people can articulate um, what may not be worth it for them based on their other goals. The other thing I wanted to say, because this might be my last chance to talk before I go to my other dinner, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which Tony didn't collect money to pay for, is that the question you asked about a you know a good death came back to me. I actually was talking to Karen about this, and I think I, I thought, why did David name this a good death? And I've been trying to come up with a different name. You know, I, I think as I hear all of these stories, and when people see this, uh, we certainly realize that a good death isn't a one-size-fits-all death. That, that it's, so maybe I thought it should be visions of good deaths with an S. But then I, you know, I think about my patient and, and that I describe, but also patients that I, that I talk to. And I, try not, I never use the word good death. I talk about what's a good life until death happens. I don't know when that is. And so really it's really de dignity, diversity, and visions of a good life. No need to thank me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, Jennifer, make a note. We'll update the program. Um, I want to give you all the last word. Any any parting comments, thoughts, suggestions? Great. Please join me in thanking the panel, first of all. That... That really was wonderful and far better than, than we could have hoped. A couple of other thank yous um, for people who are not as visible as the folks standing in front of you or sitting in front of you right now. Um, Jessica, Jessica Pagan in Marion Broom's office has been helpful in organizing a lot of the background things that we've been doing. Jacqueline Mead, James Todd, Rachel White here at the chapel. Um, special thanks to William English in our shop and a very, very special thanks to Jennifer Bowen who is knowing Jennifer probably hiding somewhere. Um, but if you've received invitations, if you received uh, information, if you're going to take advantage of the reception afterwards, um, if you're here at all, you're here because of Jennifer. So please uh, look for her um, and embarrass her by thanking her. Um, and most of all, thanks to all of you. I mean, these conversations don't work if it's one-sided. Um, and I'm delighted that all of you are here and all of you are thinking about these issues. And I'm delighted that you're willing to start these conversations. And I'm hopeful, honestly, that this will propagate, that you will come home tonight and you'll start these discussions with friends, neighbors, family members. Those discussions will turn into other conversations and there will be a ripple effect. And some of these conversations might actually come back to patients we're taking care of at, at Duke Hospital someday. That's, that's a goal. So no pressure, but I hope, I hope you can make that a reality. Please join us for the reception afterwards um, and join me in thanking the panel one more time.